Hello everyone, my name is Sarah Chen and I'm the editor of the newsletter at the Asian Neuropsychological Association or ANA. As part of the Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month in the United States, we bring to you a series of five interviews and conversations with notable scholars and leaders in our field today, which was inspired by similar work from our colleagues at the Society for Black Neuropsychology. Our fourth guest is Dr. Michael Sakamoto Pomeroy. Dr. Sakamoto Pomeroy is a neuropsychologist and associate professor at Saga University Faculty of Medicine. She is actively engaged in promoting the field of neuropsychology by providing various lectures throughout Japan. Dr. Sakamoto Pomeroy moved to the United States from Japan for her graduate education and received her PhD from Drexel University in Philadelphia. She completed her internship and postdoctoral fellowship at UCSD under the tutelage of Dr. Mark Norman. And in 2013, she returned to Japan with a vision to educate and promote the field of neuropsychology to the future generations of psychologists in Japan. Speaking to Dr. Sakamoto Pomeroy today is Dr. Nicholas Thaler. Dr. Thaler is a board certified neuropsychologist in private practice in Los Angeles, California. He is the current president for ANA and was one of its founding members. Dr. Thaler is also an associate professor at UCLA. Our association will not be what it is today without the direction and support of those of you in our community. So as such, we welcome and invite your comments, suggestions, and any insights you may have for our guests and our media team. These also include future directions or future projects that we may end up taking up. You can bring these to our attention via email at the dot ana dot newsletter at gmail.com or you can tweet us at at asian neuropsych uh, and you can also check out our website at the hyphen ana dot org finally if you enjoyed this video please feel free to check out our other videos on our youtube page and support us by liking and subscribing well, uh, good morning i think it's 9 a.m in japan right now uh, 10 a.m 10 a.m Yes. And, and would you mind telling us um, wh where you are right now, Dr. Sakamoto? Yes. Um, first of all, thank you so much for your invitation. It's such my honor to be part of this uh, conversational topic uh, talks. And I'm very, very um, excited about having conversation with you guys. And um, um, I am currently with the Saga University Medical School in Saga in Japan. And I am teaching um, basically medical students in terms of neuropsychology and ethics, bioethics and clinical ethics, um, professional, professionalism, how to you know, talk to patients, communication skills, that kind of stuff. Understood. So you're, you're a professor in Saga University, which I, is, that, is that in Kyushu? Is that right? Near Fukuoka? Yes. Hi. Down south. Ah, yes. Beautiful. Um, yes. It's and. Beautiful. Is it a combination of, of, do you do research and clinical delivery as well as teaching? Or what's your percentage breakdown of, of research versus teaching versus patients? Yeah, so that's a great question. So usually in Japan, basically what we do is we have balanced work style. So I teach, I do clinical work, and also to, I do research. So sometimes it gets very, very busy, but I like having variety of you know, job opportunities here. So I work as an associate professor. I teach um, students, but at the same time, our university has medical school. So I go to hospital and mm -hmm. meet patients, do neuropsych testing, do counseling, all that stuff. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah. Uh, and, and what kind of um, uh, patient populations do you see? Or what, what are some of the referral questions that you see in, in uh, the medical school? Yeah, so I mainly work with, um, hold on, I'm so sorry, neuropsychology per se or overall? Well, that's a great uh, question. Um, so I, I was um, speaking to referrals that are neuropsychological in nature, but if you see other types of referrals too, um, I, th I think we'd, we'd all be delighted to hear more about that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so our medical school is the one of the biggest um, university setting hospital in Kyushu area. So we see a lot of different type of uh, patients, but mainly what I do in terms of neuropsychological testing or counseling, because I was in training in HIV field in 
um, America at UCSD, HRP. So um, I work with patients, yes, <laughs> Bob Heaton and Mark Norman. And yeah, Mark. so, yeah, <laughs> I love Mark too. So um, I, I see HIV patients as well, but I also do testing for um, dementia patients mm. because, you know, we have such a aging population here in Japan. So I test, um, you know, the elderly people. Oh, gotcha. Actually, you know, Dr. Sakamoto, I know you've trained in the United States at UCSD, fantastic uh, neuropsychology program, and now you're seeing patients uh, in Japan. Do you see any sort of differences in, in the types of ways dementia manifests in Japanese patients versus those you've seen in, in the United States? Mm -hmm. So when I like started learning about dementia, I read many articles stating that in America, there are more patients with Alzheimer's disease. But in Japan, because it's kind of we eat more like a salty food, you know, that the diet is different. Therefore, you know, back then, many researchers states that stated that back then that um, many patients in Japan seems to have more vascular dementia. But yeah. I don't see that now. And actually, new, you know, coming papers are stating also, yeah, in Japan, too, we have a lot of Alzheimer patients as well. But as you know, it's not clear cut. Many patients have like a mixture between Alzheimer's disease and um, vascular dementia. And especially we have such a, you know, uh, elderly population. And some patients that I saw is over 100 years old. So they have a lot of physical problems as well. So a lot of mixture of problems. It's incredible over a hundred years old. I yes. can't imagine the battery. Amazing. Yeah, <laughs> that's fantastic. I mean, just great experience. Um, you know, I, 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 is, is there any sort of literature that supports that um, the dementia that's more of like idiopathic Alzheimer's is lower in Japan compared to the West or is, is that more of a spurious finding or, or? You know, it is very hard to argue because the basic, you know, life uh, expectation is different. Mm -hmm. Diets are different. People who started having basic, you know, physical problems such as diabetes or hypertension, those are very different. So in terms of the prevalence, I just, I can't really tell. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure out there, there are so many mixture literature about that, um, but hard to tell. Yeah, no. Well, well, thank you, Dr. Sakamoto. And, and you know, our, our um, members have submitted a number of questions um, in preparation for this interview, and I, I'd like to go through a few of them with you right now. Um, you know, I think that uh, one of the questions is, what's been your experience as an international graduate student uh, in neuropsychology in the United States? What was, what was that like for you in, in terms of training, adjustment, all that? Mm -hmm. Um. Simple answer would be like very challenging, but at the same time, it was very exciting. And as far as I know, um, I talked to my mentor, Mary Spires, and she told me that I was the first international student at Drexel University who pursued a neuropsychology track. So knowing that, that was very challenging, but yeah, I had a, such a great support system at the Drexel. And <clears throat> excuse me, even though they weren't, international students, but still people were, people had diverse background and, you know, Tanya Giovanni and everybody was very supportive and helped me to go through a uh, difficult time and, and good and bad, but I, people didn't treat me like a special way. You know what I mean? Like they mm -hmm. treated me as a graduate student. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it was challenging, but at the same time, I felt that the we, I, I felt it was a very um, great opportunity for me and just brush up my English. And, you know, I didn't speak good English when I just moved to America at age 22. So after that, I had to study very hard. And But it's, it was very worthwhile. It was a life, you know, experience. Yes. No, no it's, it's wonderful. And, and Dr. Sakamoto, I've read some of your articles, um, you know, in 2016, you put out a paper about uh, the state of neuropsychology in Japan. And uh, thank you. Let me just say, I mean, your efforts have, have paid off wonderfully. And, and thank you for disseminating the information that you, you have to share with, with all of us. 
Um, do, do you have any advice for, for students who live outside of the United States who may want to study in, in the United States, Canada, you know, in, in, in a neuropsychology program? Mm -hmm. You mean the foreign students who are currently working their PhD? In, international students who, who might mm -hmm. be undergraduates or who may not speak English as a first language? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really want to encourage them and cheer them up that it, it is like, you know, huge effort that you have to make and time consuming and all that. But I want them to believe me, it's worthwhile. And it's not just about your professional career, but also to, as a human being, as a person, how much I can't really tell how much I grew up as a person, mm -hmm. how much I appreciate, you know, what I have, my family, friends you know, co-workers, everybody, everybody's support. Based on that, I was able to successfully become a neuropsychologist and came back to Japan continuously. I teach, you know, people about neuropsychology. So um, it's a lot of work for international students, especially who weren't born in America. And, you know, maybe recently there are a lot of prejudice, prejudice going on in America, which really saddened me, mm -hmm. but it will, you know, you can get through this as a, you know, we as a group, we can get through this and just look up to, you know, bright future they have and just keep going, <laughs> making effort. Understood. Yeah. And definitely, you know, I think it's, it's great that you were trained by some of the, you know, early neuropsychologists like Bob Heaton and, and now you're, you're, you're back in, Japan and and I was wondering you know how did you translate your knowledge base to, to work back into Japan work in Japan when you uh, moved back there back to Japan what was that like mm -hmm. for you yeah so it has been eight years since I moved back to Japan and it had you know it would be a lie if I say that was so easy mm -hmm. um, because only that me and there is one more person in Tokyo her name is Angelica Isomura Motoki. We are the only two who got trained in America and they came back to Japan as a neuropsychologist. So, um, you know, we really, even now, we don't have great support here in Japan. And, you know, what I have been doing is just going around throughout Japan and try to teach them neuropsychology. What is neuropsychology? What is the difference between clinical psychology and neurology? And we can be a bridge between the two fields. and not only we, we are not just testers, you know, evaluators or examiners. We can evaluate the patients. We can translate those, um, the test results mean and mm -hmm. what kind of diagnosis we can, you know, we can tell and what kind of service we can offer. Mm -hmm. So, but in order, by doing so, what I am aiming to, what I'm, you know, um, dreaming of is developing your psych department or mm -hmm. even like a small um, laboratory. That's my dream to start teaching the actual core neuropsychology in Japan. But uh, as a first step, I have been what I have been doing is just going around throughout Japan, try to teach them how viable we can be. Because as you know, in my article that most of clinical psychologists, uh, you know, they don't have uh, full time. They work as a part time going to different schools as a school counselor. Sometimes they go to hospital and then do neuropsych testing, but mainly what they do is just testing and give the results to medical doctors, um, which is very different from my experience. Yeah, so. Oh, I understand. Um, and how has, what's the, been the reception like for you as um, someone who's a doctoral level, you know, Hakase neuropsychologist, um, where in Japan, typically psychologists have terminal master's degrees. And as you said, often do the testing almost like technicians and deliver results to the, to the medical doctors. What's that been, what's that been like for you? Yeah. So I see two sides. Some people are very excited about talking to me and learn material from me. Um, the other part of, you know, other group of people really, don't like the idea like you just came back from america you don't know anything about japanese style japanese society therefore you know we can't accept it there is a generation gap as well if i can be very honest so mm -hmm. people who learned clinical psychology long time ago i feel a little bit of 
Now rejection is a little bit of like a hurdle that I have to go over if that's a correct terminology. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and also too, the other thing that I have to bring up is that it's not really their fault, but in their master's program here in Japan to become a clinical psychologist, they don't really learn about neuropsych. Um, so what they do is they may learn about the system very briefly, basic stuff. Mm-hmm. And they may learn these are the test names and you know these tests are for children or for adults, but pretty much that's it. They don't really learn about the depth depth of each scales and they don't really have actual practice in clinical settings. What they do is after they graduated from um, graduate schools, now they learn more like individually. Mm, understood. Sound, sounded like that. So, and, and Dr. Sakamoto, I think it's it's very exciting to hear that you're you're thinking about setting up a program for neuropsychological training in Japan. And and what's your vision for for educating and promoting the promoting the field in Japan? What do you, how do you see that manifesting? You mean the neuropsych um, neuropsychology in education? Like a training program, or, or if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, so, you know, again, I need more manpower. I need more people to really do this all together. Um, so, for example, like my vision was to invite INS into Japan. But even during the time that I tried to invite INS here in Japan, it was difficult because only I had to do everything and I didn't have people around me. So in terms of education in neuropsychology, how I'm going to educate people and how I'm going to build up um, program, I think I am going to, I, I, what I need to do and I have been doing is just asking around the, um, my colleagues in Japan also to invite in like you, Nick, or Mary or Mark mm-hmm. to, to Japan actually talk to people and ha- you know, first of all, we have to educate the medical doctors. I feel that again, how we can be beneficial, how can how can how we can be very helpful for them to even lighten their job load. Mm-hmm. So, no, I understand. Yeah. And and personally speaking, I mean, it's always been a dream to come to Japan to speak about. Absolutely, it. please, yeah. Um, but actually, that I'm going to jump to a question that um, someone asked about. Uh, if someone has graduated from a North American doctor program and, and was interested in working Japan, um, and they ask, what are some workplace cultural norms to be aware of? And I, I definitely think we should, I want to ask you that, but also I think we should ask, um, you know, what sort of avenues are there, are there for a, a North American um, graduate student to pursue if they wanted to pursue neuropsychology in Japan? So I, I guess that, that was two parts. I'm sorry. So what the first part would be, what are some workplace cultural norms to be aware of? Yeah. So like I said, if you want to work in Japan, it's very hard to get full-time job. So like me, right, working at the university, not only doing the neuropsych, but other stuff, such as you know, educating medical students. That's many people do here in Japan. But also to, it may be a slight different topic, but you, I really recommend to uh, recommend them to be fluent in Japan uh, in Japanese mm. because that's the key. If you speak only English, you won't get job here because majority of us don't speak English, and it's very hard for for you guys to you know get a job for North Americans. So um, it depends on how fluent you are in ja- in Japanese. First of all, second of all, so. Um, the people I know who are doing neuropsych um, stuff is like some of them are in, mo- most of them, I should say, most of them are living in Tokyo and then working in international society. So, for example, um, you know, Americans whose kids may have de- developmental disorders. So, the neuropsychologists test them and offer rehab or a special service for kids with autism or something like that. Yeah. So if you live in a big city and then you may be able to, you know, really utilize your bilingual skills. But if you speak only English, it's very hard to get a job here. Or like maybe you can be a researcher, but you may not be able to clinical work. 
would you, would you recommend that uh, practitioners pass perhaps the Japanese language proficiency proficiency test? Uh, you know, N one, the you know the most rigorous of the of the tests. Yeah, N one or N two. N two. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, ideally, no, N one is perfect. You know, perfect to get a job. Gotcha. But, because as you know, Nick, not only speaking, you have to read Japanese, and Japanese has three forms of you know uh, written language: hiragana, katakana, and kanji. If you can't read, you know, do, um, you know the test scores and all that. Yeah, that's a problem. So you really have to be profi- uh, proficient for all written language as well. So let's see. Um, you know, your 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 paper from 2016, I think, was was incredible, and and our audience agrees because we have some questions about it. Um, one of them is, uh, you know, five years has elapsed, has passed, and and has things changed since then? Does does neuropsychology look any different than it did when you wrote that paper? Mm-hmm. Yeah, in my paper in 2016, I wrote about um, certified psychology license. You know. Um, it, it was new in Japan. So basically back then, before that, before 2017, uh, mainly clinical psychologists um, doing testing and um, providing counseling at the hospital. But then a certified psychology, the licensure came out um, around 2017. So now people we applied and took the exam, you know, they got licensure in uh, become a such for a psych- psychologist. So that licensure itself, the certification is a new thing in Japan. But of course, there is a problem too, because not only um, it becomes a little bit less required in terms of education and training to become a certified certified psychologist. Mm-hmm. Because you you go to college, four-year college, and then you learn something in psychology or re- relate to field. Mm-hmm. And then out there, you get two years of, of experience or master's level education, and then you can take the exam. So in terms of the quality of education or quality of training, certified, certified psychology may be a little bit less than clinical psychology. Uh, clinical psychologist certified. So um, there are debates going on, which one would have been better. Because now, by just getting the certified psychology, even though your background wasn't clinical psychology, still you can work at the hospital. Like for example, you know, some people came from industrial psychology, but because they got licensed in certified psychologist. So well, that's interesting. Okay. Um, and, and is this is the science of neuropsychology generally accepted in Japan? Such as are, are, are there whether they're neurologists or neurosurgeons or psychologists reading articles about you know the the cognitive profile of Alzheimer's versus frontal temporal dementia, for instance, is that readily accepted or or, or, or not? Yeah, it is ex- accepted. However, I have to say that I don't know how much people appreciate that field as a neuropsychology or neurology. Mm-hmm. They don't really separate out those two fields, which may be a good thing, you know, because we can collaborate with mm-hmm. medical doctors easily. But, you know, I don't know how much they really appreciate as a very independent field, medical field. Understood. Understood. Well, I think even in the United States, sometimes that happens. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, now, um are there workshops or courses that um, are offered? Are there professional neuro? I guess the first question is: Are there professional neuropsychology associations in in Japan that um, we should be aware of? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there are neuropsychological association here in Japan, but again, mainly members are neuro uh, not neuropsychologists or more um, neurologists. Mm-hmm. Main members of the conference, so the, or association, so. Um, not not like you know INS or NAN mm-hmm. in America that majority of members are neuropsychologists. Is the audience primarily <laughs> neurologists, or is there is there a psychiatrist who attend, or a master's level psychologist, or is it really under the purview? Yeah, of the sure. Yeah, some psychiatrists attend the association, the conference, and yeah, it's a mixture. 
like based on what kind of patients you are seeing at the clinics, right? Clinical settings. So yeah, there are mixtures, but mainly I have to say neurologists. And Dr. Sakamoto, if, if if there are um, members of ANA who who would like to participate in a workshop, maybe they speak Japanese fluently. Um, are there websites or, or, or links they should be aware of, or they could stay up to date on when these presentations are provided? Sure. Yeah, there is a link. There are links. So if it's okay, I, I am more than happy to introduce those links to you. So if you want to, mm-hmm. if you email it to us, we can disseminate it afterwards. That would be great. And, and great. Uh, I see uh, Sarah Chan is. is <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I'm more than happy to do that. Well, let's. Um, let's Sure, go ahead. I'm so sorry. Can I add one more thing? Yes. So when I say neuropsychology field, this field in Japan, um, I want to add one more thing is that there are other um, people um, who are also doing the testing, maybe in America too, like, um, you know, like a OT, sometimes OT or SD and, you know, they also help testing as well. But again, they are not really trained in testing. So that that also, I am trying to train them mm-hmm. like appropriately to do well, the new testing. There's certainly um, OTs and speech language therapists who give like the trail making test in the United States. Right. And they, I mean, that that goes beyond, I think. But, but is that something that happens in, in, in Japan as well? Is, is a lot of uh, OTs? Yeah, more than I thought. Like I expected but I see more and that's why sometimes like, you know, it's a great opportunity for me here at my university, university hospital that I can train them. But I wish I get more opportunity to go more hospitals or universities and to teach them because sometimes I see they don't understand the rules, why the rules are there. That's yeah. That's a concern. I I agree. Yeah. Um, That's my concern too. While we're on the topic of tests, um, what sort of uh, common tests that, you know, when you were at San Diego, you gave that are also administered uh, routinely in, in Japan? What sort of specific neuropsychological tests? Yeah. So first of all, you know, I want to really emphasize how great trainings and opportunities I got in America. And, you know, my mentors, my supervisors, you know, they have their own battery because you know they understand the brain function and all that then diseases and um you know accents and all that so you know the beauty of neuropsychology in america is that you understand therefore you can actually you know create your own battery based on the patient's needs right in japan it's really hard to do first of all we don't have a lot of testing materials so basically what you know people do is just translate whatever available in America or Canada or European countries and just translated those testing to Japanese. So sometimes the like, culturally not appropriate, that's I struggle with. And um, second of all, there are certain testing tests that we can actually bill for, billable. That's interesting. Yeah, in order to get paid, right? So, um, so they, I shouldn't say popular, but what we use a lot is risk and waste. Okay. Yeah. Um, you, uh, website. Yeah. Yeah. Wixler test and um, MMSC and the Hasegawa dementia rating, which is more like original, original here in Japan. Um, yeah. So again, you know, I wrote all of the billable tests in my article, 2016. It hasn't really changed. So if, you know, somebody's very interested in what kind of tests we do and what kind of tests are billable for mm-hmm. insurance company. Yeah. Um, awesome. Please, okay. yeah, look on my... So Sakamoto 2016 and the clinical neuropsychologist. That's that's the article, right? Am I right? Yeah. Wonderful. Um, another question from um, our audience is, um, what does your job look like on a weekly and daily basis? So a rundown of, of your schedule, patient caseload, supervision, teaching, research, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it varies, depends on what year, how can I say, what part of the year, I should say. So for example, mainly I teach at the university. So that's my, my role as a teacher. 
So, um, for example, right now I'm teaching first and second, um, second year students in medical school because medical school is different too. Um, in Japan, they go in college and the college itself has six years of process to become a doctor, a medical doctor. So I mainly teach first and second year medical students. Okay. Um, and right now, um, the, 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 how can I say, the beginning of the half of the year, Mm -hmm. of the school year I should say so I'm I teach maybe four or five classes right now so I'm busy with teaching ah. but toward yeah towards summer I more focus on my research and in terms of clinical load I see patients maybe mm, two days a week I see patients and do testing and counseling understood yeah um, what sort of research are you currently doing, Dr. Sakamoto? Yeah, so I started, you know, developing this tablet version of a neuropsych testing at the UCSD um, with Tom Marquette and Bo Heaton. So I continuously doing stuff like that, like developing neuropsych testing, but on the tablet so that the patients can do by themselves in the waiting room, mm. because that's something related to our clinical setting in Japan. So we don't have a lot of manpower. Mm -hmm. So like I said earlier, <laughs> repeatedly, but we, you know, we can't really have a clinical psychologist or neuropsychologist at hospital all the time. So even our big hospital, university hospital, has only one clinical psychologist who is uh, working as a uh, full-time. Mm. So, you know, my hope was that, you know, in order to reduce the stress or, of the medical doctors or clinical psychologists and also to poor HIV patients or mainly this, you know, tablet-based neuropsych testing is for HIV patients who have hands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's my research interest. Mm -hmm. And also too, I'm developing more um, neuropsych testing appropriate to Japanese population. And actually that segues very nice to the, the next question. So. What are some of the types of referrals that you see the most? Like what is what is recognized or or valued in Japan for, for neuropsychology? What types of conditions? Oh, or viruses? big one is dementia. Dementia. Yeah. Almost a good. Yeah, most of the referral that I get, not per se, not not personally, but then our hospital got a lot of um, referrals for dementia patients. The reason why, because elderly people, especially in rural area, they still have to drive. But then the elder people are causing a lot of car accidents, automobile accidents. So, you know, sometimes we get referral from police stations to get tested, mm. these patients. So, yeah. Um, and, and do you see a difference in, for example, rates of dementia versus pseudo dementia, you know, or depression mimicking dep dementia in Japan versus your training in, in San Diego? Mm -hmm. Yeah, answer? so, right. So, um, I, this is my personal um, opinion. So, mm -hmm. I can be wrong. I want to say that first. Mm -hmm. But American people are more sensitive to their loved ones change over time. So, they take, you know, elderly people to, to clinics a little bit earlier than Japan, I feel. Hmm. Like Japan, like, oh, yeah, they are just old, you know, they may be forgetful, but don't worry, that that's not bad. So when I see patients, maybe it's because of Saga. I live in Saga, mm -hmm. which is now a big city. It's like a um, uh, medium size. So maybe it could be that. And there are so many farmers that maybe um, their sons and daughters didn't really realize how bad they are. Mm -hmm. But when I test patients, Many cases are very like a full, full dementia, not like a pseudo dementia or MCI per se. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, I see more pseudo dementia or MCI in America than Japan. I feel, but again, I don't live in Tokyo, so if you go to big cities like Tokyo, Osaka, you may see more patients who may be pseudo dementia or MCI. You know, I I, I actually agree with you, and again, this is purely anecdotal myself, but I reflect on how my family with my Japanese grandmother, basically it took a lot before there was consideration of dementia. Mm -hmm. um, 
And then even you're right, the rural versus urban setting um, can make a difference in, in the timing of a diagnosis. So mm -hmm. That's a wonderful insight. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, from the patient standpoint, what is their view of neuropsychology? What sort of cultural or, or otherwise barriers do you, have you encountered working with Japanese patients? Mm -hmm. um, first of all, as you know, maybe Nick, that psychiatric problems or like a brain diseases, many Japanese are afraid of, or some people even may feel ashamed of. Mm, yeah. So they are very afraid of being tested, to be honest. Mm. And then somehow we have this like a hierarchy in medical field that doctor, medical doctor is the top. So if medical doctor tells you, you need to get tested, and I'm going to introduce this Dr. Sakamoto to test you, then the patient is fine. But if I suddenly show up and then if I ask the patient, like, I need to test you, then they may have some, they may show some resistance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They really have a problem with testing, especially mm -hmm. young and, you know, I don't want to be problem problematic, but like young and female, especially for elderly male patients. Seems mm. to have a problem. Well, I think that no, I think that's a that's a very um, fair point, and, and kind of segues into a question I that was posed, which is, is 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 there an intersection between um, you know gender and psychology versus you know MD that, that you've encountered that's been a, an obstacle for your work? Yeah, definitely. So, like I said, there is a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. So, medical doctor is the top, and then we are like down here including like nurses and neuropsychologists. Or, uh, we don't use you know, neuropsychologists, but clinical psychologists and OT, ST, PT, you know, um, we are down here. So even there is no, like, to me, it, there is no between like layers. Like mm -hmm. me, yeah, medical doctor is at the top and we're here. Mm -hmm. So at first I was ready for that because I grew up in Japan and I lived in Japan until 22. And then I moved to America. So I kind of knew the culture here. Maybe that's why also I moved to America. <laughs> but anyway, um, that's a different story. Um, but, you know, what I did when I came back, when I returned to Japan, what I did was that I really want to be open-minded and I wanted to try whatever is possible. Mm -hmm. So I went to conferences and I met medical doctors and, you know, I tried to talk to them more like freely. Mm -hmm. And what I did in America, what's wonderful things in America, um, but Japan, so Japan has a lot of, you know, good, good parts of of system and society, like, you know, helping each other also to medical fees are not so expensive. Mm -hmm. Insurance is not that expensive. There are pros and cons that, you know, all countries have, right? So I try to talk to medical doctors and what I've learned about and what I can do and what, what I can talk about. Many people are very open-minded medical doctors and mm -hmm. they invited me to talk, give a talk at their hospitals or conferences. So especially in Kyushu area, people are very more open-minded. So um, yeah, so it was an obstacle, but not as bad as I thought. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> that's, that's good. No, I think that's that's a positive yeah. message we we should share. Right. The stigma is not is not so bad, I think. And you know, I'm sure. Dr. Sakamoto, with your perseverance and, and your reputation, it's just only going to get better. So, oh, thank you. Yeah, other key is that I I know like Japanese people have pride as well, which is very understandable. So if I let's say like if I came out like oh in America, American people great and America they're so advanced, you know. If I kept bringing up all the good thing about America, of course, you know they feel so little, right? Like okay, we are not that great then. Instead, like, you know, we can do like that. Mm -hmm. Or like we have already this system that we should really keep, right? Mm -hmm. So again, bringing up what is pros and cons in each country and what we can do in Japan for the patients, for us, right? To protect our mental health and physical health as well as um, medical field, people who are working in the medical field. So that, I think that's the key. Try to show, you know, our country also has a great, Thanks. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, 
if I may ask my own question, and I think, you know, we've co-authored a book chapter together and I mentioned, uh, it's almost a hypothesis on my part since I have not re- lived in Japan for a substantial amount of time and I'm, I'm American born, American raised, but I always thought that because of the emphasis of um, test performance determining um, trajectories in a, a Japanese student's early career, the the format of testing for neuropsychology might um, result in, in uh, maybe more test anxiety than than we might see in in the United States. And I say this because if if you disagree, then then I completely accept you know your your ideas on that. But I just thought to pose that to you as is that a is that something you've seen test anxiety as being a factor working with Japanese patients or, or not? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it's a huge one. So our job as a you know me. Personally, like clinical psychologist and the neuropsychologist, what I try to do is reduce the anxiety because they don't want to show any weakness per se. You know, they they say I'm fine. You know, I I have nothing wrong, and you know, but then by talking through things, you know, you don't you don't have any difficulties in everyday life, and it's okay. I'm also forgetful t- sometimes, and reducing the their anxiety, and also to even middle of the testing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I say, yeah, this test is very difficult. Me too. I feel this is difficult. You know, I maybe I would say more um, comments like that to Japanese patients than American patients. Mm. That's a good point, actually. Yeah, to you know, to let them help to show their best performance, and I don't want their anxiety to really reduce their actual mm. skills and ability. Oh. That that makes sense, and thank you for for validating what I thought. But um, let's see. Um, now you you talked a little bit about healthcare delivery in Japan, and, and um, you know I think uh, like from what I know, it, it is certainly um, much more affordable in Japan than the United States. Um, do do patients pay at all for an evaluation? Is there any private pay services? What's what's kind of the dynamic there with regard to? Yeah. That? So mainly in Japan, everybody has insurance mm-hmm. basically everybody and then okay. there are only three types so everybody has one of three insurance mm-hmm. yeah and you don't pay um, most of the time elderly people has to pay only 10 percent of the cost mm-hmm. and then us younger people pay 30 mm-hmm. percent of the whole cost and then if the whole cost reach to certain amount of the you know, the money, then you can apply for different type of insurance so that your payment won't exceed more than like $800 or $1,000. You can adjust that because many people can't afford to. I mean, people can maybe, but then that's our health, you know, health system that we are offering. It's, it's a challenge in the United States. I mean, neuropsychological evaluations are expensive and insurance is a, you know, it's an obstacle, I think. It's a frequent topic of conversation on the listserv. So, yeah, absolutely. Is, is there uh, are there folks who do um, private practice in testing or assessment or neuropsychology at all in Japan? No, as far as I know, no one is really doing independent, um, you know, private practice. Is there any sort of pediatric market where um, parents pay for their child to be evaluated for learning differences or, or anything like that? Maybe mm-hmm. not private practice, but in outside of yes. the Yes, yeah. So I don't know which comes first, <laughs> egg and chicken, I guess. But, um, you know, maybe in America too, but maybe um, the diagnostic criteria has been changed and that influenced the number of children they get diagnosed with um, autism. Mm-hmm. So the number of autistic children in Japan is increasing drastically. Mm. So testing opportunity for pediatric is also growing as well. So some people actually help the pediatricians to do testing, but not independently. You know, they work with the with the pediatricians and at the hospital or private setting, and not independently as a neuropsychologist. Uh, you know, and, and are there some? And, and forgive me, Dr. Sakamoto, because I, I don't know your experience with working with autism spectrum, but if, if you know, are there some cultural considerations in diagnosing autism in Japan versus the United States that you might be aware of? Mm, I don't 
really, yeah, I am more, um, I work with adults. So right. not necessarily, yeah, as a movement therapist, I work with kids with autism, but not necessarily neuropsych truck. Mm -hmm. So I'm not really familiar with that. But um, yeah, in terms of like a timing, testing timing and how the kids are diagnosed with um, um, autism takes mm -hmm. a long time here in Japan. And if people actually, kids are waiting like online to get tested and diagnosed, but there are great services here that like, for example, Parents with autistic kids, they pay only $46 per month for services. Wow. And the services are every day after school, even on Saturdays and Sundays or holidays. So that, you know, parents can do what they need to do while kids with autism are in service. And wow. they also learn that, that after school, how to communicate with people, play, you know, they play each other, but they within the play, they learn the communication skills. So That's I'm very impressed by that. That's one of the things yeah. like, wow. And it's very, you know, inexpensive. It's very affordable. Yeah, $46 a month. I mean, that's, wow. Well, br maybe uh, more broadly um, asking about um, cultural values or considerations. Um, if, you, if, if Dr. Sakamoto, if you adapted a test from, from the United States or Canada in Japan, are there some cultural um, considerations that we should be aware of if, if any of us were to adapt other than just translating, you know, the language word for word? Mm. It's, it's hard because is, if you are just giving a testing, you have to use those testing materials, right? Mm -hmm. So you really cannot do anything and sometimes when I give even like a waste or risk to the patients, and especially waste, I use waste a lot. So there are certain things that culturally this is not really appropriate, or some object names that you know the patients have to say, mm -hmm. like Ada's cog, and yeah, those are translated into Japanese. But some um, tools that we ask the patients to name what they are, mm -hmm. those are not really popular here, such as tong. We don't really use tongs. That really, yeah, yeah. Or mask. We don't face mask, right? So mm -hmm. those kind of things we don't really use here, but still it's translated into Japanese and still used for the testing, mm -hmm. like a Boston naming test. You know, we have to be careful because abacus we use a lot, so abacus shouldn't be the last picture mm -hmm. on the Boston naming test. So when you are talking about the test structure or culturally appropriate test, then it's a different topic that I have to talk about because it's more like a test per se. But as a neuropsychologist giving a testing, like you said, what I always care about is kind of give them some time to warm up so that they don't feel so nervous, like what's going to happen, you know, mentally. But other than that, once you started giving the testing, it's really not so, um, not so different, I should say. Mm. But uh, it, one thing that I want to bring up, this, this may be a good opportunity for me, but um, we really need uh, Japanese-based standards, norms. Mm -hmm. So, for example, waste, why waste is widely used in Japan? Because we have Japanese norms. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But do we have California verbal learning test in Japanese version? No. Mm -hmm. And I, me personally, want to develop such like you know verbal learning tests, and I have been trying, but still I don't have enough data to develop norms. Um, but that's the other thing. We really have to develop Japanese norms, and again, no. we need colleagues to do so. We need money, like NIH funding. We mm -hmm. have. We also have a similar funding system here in Japan, like NIH, which is called Kakenhi. Hmm. But the amount of research funding is w way smaller than NIH funding. So like me, recently I received it, but it's only $50,000 for three years. Is it for test development or? Yeah, for my research, yeah. Well, congratulations. I mean, that's- Thank that's you. <laughs> well-deserved. Uh, and, and yes, no, I think developing norms for Japanese populations is definitely uh, the next step, it seems, for, for disseminating 
um, neuropsychology in Japan. Um, you know, I personally speaking, back when I tested in Japanese, I bought a, a Japanese Wims R and um, yeah, <laughs> I had some issues with it. <laughs> right. Maybe yeah. maybe a conversation for another day, but um, I'm glad to hear that you're you know you're you're working on that, and I think that's fantastic. It's going to make mm -hmm. such a difference. Um, let's see, uh, we have just a few more questions, and and I don't want to take up too much more of your time because I know it's the hour is almost up. Um, let's see, uh, what do you, actually this probably gives, what we were just saying makes sense in that what do you see the next neuropsychology generation in Japan going to look at? What sort of barriers do you see? What do you see happening for, for the child who's maybe 10 or 12 and wants to do neuropsychology and they're growing up in Japan? I mean, you know, what, what do you see happening? In terms of neuropsychology, right? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, that's something that I really want to do. Like one of the biggest reasons why I wanted to return to Japan was that when I was um, at the UCSC, there are so many people who are bilingual, trilingual, mm -hmm. and I was really seeking out myself where I want to end up. Like, yes, UCSD, there are tons of great people, smart people, intelligent people. And I was, I wanted to be more who I was. Mm -hmm. And that was the biggest reason for me to return to Japan to educate new, new generations. So that's why, like I said earlier, that I really want to develop new psych program or some training, um, you know, <laughs> program in Japan. So younger generation learn what is neuropsychology and, oh, I want to be a neuropsychologist instead of becoming a neurologist. Mm -hmm. That's what I want. You know, I want to be more psychology side, you know. Yes. Um, yeah, so that's what I want. I really want to do that. But again, I really need more people mm -hmm. to help me out as a group. You know, I, I have great people, but people living in different prefectures in Japan and people busy with their own life. So that's my challenging, even eight years later. Do you know of any other, you mentioned someone in Tokyo um, and for the audience, are there if someone who spoke Japanese well wanted to study neuropsychology, um, they could come work for you or study in your lab. Um, mm -hmm. Are there some other folks who have who have similar um, labs or, or, or positions in Japan that that the audience may want to know about? Yeah. So in terms of positions, like you know, so again, Angelica is living in Tokyo, but she's more doing clinical work. She's mm -hmm. now really working at the university as a teacher, as a professor, nothing like that. But then there are other Japanese folks who are interested in neuropsych testing. And actually, because we have a small group who are bilingual mm -hmm. and helping all the pharmaceutical studies and trials as well. So yeah, I have small group of people, but then not necessarily everybody's interested in research or education and all that. So. Um, I can't really point out, oh yeah, these are the locations that you know they are teaching your psychology. Okano sensei, I think if I'm correct, there is one person who is a Japanese and she also um asked um NA members members about um your experience in America or North America about neuropsychology because she she wants to develop neuropsych program. Mm -hmm. Where she is at now, Tohoku University. I forgot. I'm so sorry. I forgot. But Okamura Sensei. Okamura Sensei. Kana? Yes. It may be, uh, well, well, we'll talk. I'll send you an email. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, sorry. About, sorry. <laughs> I think it's wonderful that, you know, I mean, I think we're at the cusp of something that uh, 10, 15 years from now, there is going to be a, a, a wider outreach of neuropsychology in Japan. And, uh, I think that's great. I think you'll be at the forefront. So mm -hmm. thank you. Wow. Um, Dr. Sakamoto, any, any last thoughts before we close the interview? Oh, well, thank you so much for, again, um, giving me this great opportunity to, to speak, you know, talk about neuropsychology in Japan. And, you know, we are baby as compared to American neuropsychology. However, we are making small steps 
And, you know, Okamura sensei too, that we try to, you know, educate in your psychology in Japan and provide better service to patients. So one day I really want you or other members of ANA or other, you know, INS members to come to Japan and give talk to us and teach us what is neuropsychology as a, you know, from advanced country. Wow. I, I say yeah. we have a lot to learn from each other. I, I don't think, um, I think there's still, a, you know, I have a million more questions I could ask you, Dr. Sakamoto, but I won't take up your time with those. But anytime you want us to come to Japan, you know, we are we are ready. So thank you. Great. And fantastic. Thank you for your your time and your valuable insights. And, and uh, I do admire the, the wonderful work you're doing in Japan and, and uh, grateful to have met you. It was, you know, San Diego, you know, was it 2015, maybe? <laughs> right, that was. Yeah. So wonderful. Okay. Well, again, thank you for taking the time. And, and I'm sure our audience is going to be very appreciative of the insights you have to share. Yeah, great. Yeah, anytime, please, you know, audience to to audience that if you have any questions, you know, I may not be able to respond right away, but I'm happy to answer those questions as well. Thank you.